of citizen awareness, engagement, contributions, but also a deepening of greed of the most brutal kind. And in fact, I see free trade as the first system created for the rule of greed. And people might think it begins with WTO and GATT, but the East India Company took over India through a free trade treaty, obtained through bribing a Mughal empire that was in the decline. Um, I think it was a 500 rupee bribe. That's about $10. Um, and of course, the same things we see with free trade today of unequal rights uh, for citizens of the country and exclusive trade defended by military for the outsider. In this case, the first corporation created in the world, the East India Company. 1600 it was created. National Post is this long story of a young man called Justin Borg who just went out and shot Mounties, saying that he was attempting to start a rebellion against an oppressive, corrupt government that he insisted was squelching the freedom of most Canadians and serving only the rich. Because this issue of deepening inequality has not been solved. It's got aggravated. And with it is connected the new negative identities that are being nurtured. So violent economy is feeding violent identities. So on page on page three is this long piece on coffee with RCMP about this other young man, Michael Zerhaf Bibiu, who also ran through some more people. And of course, this used to be stories over the last decade that we heard from the United States. This isn't the Canada I was familiar with, it was a long time ago. It's not the Canada Mike Moore talked about in his film Bowling for Columbine, which is contrasting Canada with south of the border. And the shootings, just two days ago, there's been another shootout in a Washington school. And this time, this young man, Jalen, actually invited his best friends to lunch. And at the lunch table shot that day. Now what is happening to us that we could be losing our humanity so fast? I'm not saying everyone, but some. And I want to talk about what I think is happening. We've created an economic model that thinks that it gives license to destroy the planet, create deep inequalities, grab resources, destroy laws, and basically shut down the functioning of society. It goes hand in hand with the politics that stops representing people and their will and their welfare. Because the way the system works is if they get it through, then they'll get to the World Food Program or the FAO and say, make this compulsory for every child. Let the public system buy it up. This is not going to be a market of people going to a shelf and choosing golden rice. There is no market of that kind. It's only through coercion and deceit they can create such a market by misleading people that this is a solution. More recently, they came up with this GMO banana and last year we started a campaign in India um, because our government was contributing to an Australian scientist who's getting $15 million from Bill Gates. For the GMO banana. Now in the case of banana for iron, 
Alternatives have 7,000% more iron. And banana has 0.44 milligrams per 100 grams. Fire, and even if they double and triple and make it five times, it'll be insignificant compared to what we get out of a little turmeric in a curry or the tamarind in the summer. I've called all this a blind approach. So more recently they came up with a super banana for Uganda. Genetically engineered super banana. And this is a fascinating story because I was, I was traveling in Indonesia to celebrate a victory of farmers. You know, around the world, and I can't go into too much detail, but the two strands that the biotech industry is using to monopolize seed is first, create patents on life. Now, a patent on life is so wrong because a patent is granted for an invention. A, a life form is not invented. It can be manipulated, it can be contaminated, but it is not created. And definitely a seed is not created when a Roundup resistant gene is put into it. The next generation of seed makes itself. That's part of what living organisms are about, that they make themselves. But now that making of living organisms being appropriated through this creative power of capital. And patents are being taken. So I was very fortunate in 1987 to have been invited to a meeting on biotechnology where all this was laid out by the industry. And it's at that meeting I decided I was going to spend the rest of my life saving seeds and defending seed freedom and defending farmers' rights. The, there's records now that Monsanto has admitted they wrote the laws of intellectual property in the World Trade Organization. They said we were the patient, diagnostician, physician, all in one. And what was the problem? What was their sickness? Their sickness was their pharmacy of sins. And we are finding that the more you ally yourself with the ecological processes and the laws of nature, and these are scientific laws, the laws of violation of nature are not, is not science. Knowing the subtleties of the processes which renew life, understanding how pests are controlled and how soil fertility is renewed, understanding how pollinators work, understanding how the seed works, that is a knowledge of life. That's the knowledge we need. We've had a century of the knowledge of creating death parading as the only science. But knowledge of death is good at killing. The planet, the biodiversity, our health, our freedom. Mm -hmm. The challenge today is between extinction and extermination or celebrating our freedom within a network of the web of life ensuring that the freedom of every other species, every other person, is protected through our actions. Thank you.
He used it first in 1906 on a 9-11. We call it the other 9-11. When the apartheid regime was trying to impose the division of society uh, through on the basis of race. And he said we will not register ourselves, we will not be divided by race because we are one common citizenry. Um, he then practiced it to fight against the compulsory planting of indigo, where farmers could not grow enough food for themselves because they had to grow indigo for the textile industry. And then in 1930, the British thought, oh, you know, tropical climate, they need a lot of salt. Good way to monopolize the salt and get more arms to control. So they made it illegal for Indians to make salt. And Gandhi walked to the beach, picked up the salt room, and said, nature gives it for free. We need it for our survival. We will continue to make salt. We will not obey your laws. Of course, you know, every time, was jailed. But the salt laws could never be implemented. We've taken inspiration from two gifts of Gandhi. For the seed, for saving seed, the spinning wheel. Gandhi said, we make our own cloth. Why, why should we be colonized in order to buy cloth? You know, grow cotton under compulsory systems, grow uh, indigo under slave systems, destroy our uh, textile industry, and import bad cloth. So he said, we make our own cloth. Yeah. We took inspiration and said, we'll make our own seed. There was an attempt in 2004 to introduce laws that would prohibit us from having our own seed. I traveled the length and breadth of India to, um, to talk to farmers. And I, I think I took more than 100,000 signatures to our prime minister to say Gandhi refused to obey the salt laws. And here are 100,000 people to begin with who will not obey laws that fight for the truth of life on earth. Hello, Benya. Uh, great pleasure. So uh, earlier today, our premier, Jack Wall, uh, announced that he was going to go to India to uh, promote our potash and all the technologies that we have here in Saskatchewan for agriculture. So my question is to you, is in a society that's so embedded in industrialization, how do we go about, so like I'm from a farming family, uh, even though I'm an environmentalist, it's very hard to, to uh, break away from these ideologies that are so embedded politically, socially, uh, in North America, and especially Saskatchewan. So basically, like, where do we start? What do we do? And how do we follow in India's footsteps to make uh, seed sovereignty a, a big issue here, com compared, to, like, uh, compared to Monsanto's rule? Well, I think you begin where you are. If you're already farming, I think that's a very big part of the solution. In terms of seed sovereignty, you know, we launched this global campaign, Citizens Alliance for Seed Freedom. In this talk, exactly. So if it is off topic, please just sit my mic down. Um, you've said previously that um, the increase, the exponential increase in certain hu uh, human diseases such as Alzheimer's, uh, uh, diabetes is um, correlated with uh, the exponential increase in genetically modified crop use. And you seem to make an inference that these are causal. Um, I'm wondering what in statistically significant empirical data you use to um, uh, infer the causal relationship between these two correlations. I don't do those studies. I cite others who've done those studies. From some fundamental knowledge of processes, to say this could be a possibility, those possibilities need to be looked at instead of hounding the scientists who've done the work. I know that Eric Serolini is going to be a guest here soon. And no one has done a longer term study on the health issues uh, than him on organ failure and tumors. Um, he didn't, wasn't expecting the tumors, but the same research came out of the Russian Academy of Sciences. So all I'm saying is we need more research. The push 
to commercialize GMOs in ignorance of their impact is not acceptable in a democratic society. Thank you, Dr. Shiva, wonderful. I was wondering if you're aware that the multinational seed companies are building a seed vault in the Arctic, and if you would comment on that, please. Okay, um, in fact, there's a film made called Terra Madre, where one of Itali Italy's premier film directors called Hermano Olmi mm -hmm. has traveled to that vault, as well as come to the Navdanya Sea, say, back, and he's, he's contrasted the two, because, you know, the vault up in Norway is assuming that you have, they call it the doomsday vault. We call our gardens, gardens of hope. They talk in the doomsday vault. Um, and the idea is that out of these hundreds of thousands of seeds that governments have given them, or individual seed collectors have given them, they will overnight in an emergency be able to breed a new seed. That's not how it works. The only seeds that will see us through climate change are the ones who are evolving in the different climates in our farms. Evolutionary breeding, which means living seed banks, planting the crops, is the only way. 